But today we want to come and, and hear a word from the Lord. And so why don't we pray and ask God to speak to our hearts today that we would hear his word today. Let's pray together. Father, we come today. We thank you for the beautiful music that has prepared our hearts for this moment. And Father, we want to hear from your authoritative word of God in our lives. We trust it. We believe it is your word. It is our guide. It is our counsel. It is your authority for us to live by. And so, Father, we pray that you'll speak to us as we are reading the Bible through in the New Testament together. And may these scriptures reaffirm and bless as we have read this week. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you dare stand over the shoulder of Rembrandt and look as he's painting a masterpiece? And would you dare say to Rembrandt, you missed a stroke here or there, or you needed to change the, the lighting or the color content of what you're painting? Who would dare say anything to Rembrandt? But would anybody watch as Wolfgang Mozart was composing a masterpiece and he was writing and, and in his mind hearing the music and, and that you would interrupt what he was doing and say that you needed to add another note here or that you needed to become um, a little bit more loud in your uh, music here or slow it down. Nobody in their right mind would ever say to Wolfgang Mozart that I needed to change what you were doing. Or about, how about Frank Lloyd Wright, the great architect in America, that somebody would look over a sheet that he is designing and, and to say that, hey, you needed more height or depth here on a building. His buildings are known worldwide as such a great masterpiece and for any of us to walk up and be critical of Frank Lloyd Wright and to give our opinions of what he has done. As you know, the Masters is coming up next week. Can you imagine one of us standing behind Jack Nicholson, watching his swing when he has won eight majors in his life, and saying to Jack Nicholson, I, I think your swing could be improved a little if you did this or that. Those that I've just mentioned, they are masters in their field. They are the best of the best in what they have accomplished. And how foolish it would be for us to ever come along and say, hey, I think it could be done better. I think I could improve on what you have done. That would be so foolish for me or you to say that to one of these but how foolish it would be for us to ever criticize God to ever say that there's a better way than the cross that he so designed for us to be saved at but we're going to see today together that the wisdom of God is superior to the world open your Bibles if you would to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Many of you have already looked at this text this morning in your Sunday school classes, and so we want to affirm that again and, and see that again as we read it together. And so as your Bibles are open to 1 Corinthians chapter 18, we're going to read through verse 25 together. For the word of the cross, notice, is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever, and I will set aside where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through the wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews asked for signs and, and Greeks searched for wisdom. 
But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Paul first points out the fact that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are in the world. The cross. The cross. What bearing does that have on a life today? The cross, it's a strange thing. It's been a symbol for almost 2,000 years. The cross, how has it changed a life? What is it doing in the world? And to those who have no relationship to Christ, it's foolishness. What value does the old rugged cross have in this world today? What value does it have to an individual? It's nonsense. It's silliness to those that are in the world. George Clooney, the love life of all the women of our church, right? George Clooney really speaks the words of the mindset of the world today. And George Clooney said these words. He said, I don't believe in heaven and hell. I don't know if I believe in God, end of quote. You see, when you start mentioning the cross to people that are in the world, it just seems foolishness. It, it seems something old-fashioned. It seems like a myth, it, a fairy tale to them. And Paul says, in a sense, the cross of Christ is foolishness to those who do not receive him. And we find that the cross of Jesus is planted in the world, and it divides the world in in different camps. One camp looks upon the cross and, and sees the cross, and they say, man, that's foolishness. That's silliness. And they look at you today of being here, and they think how silly that is that you would come voluntarily to come and sit in hard pews and padded chairs in the attic, and that later some of you will will see to it that you want to give and contribute in order that the message of the cross would go forth into the world. And they see that as foolishness. But on the other side of the cross, there are those who have received Christ as their Savior, and they see the cross as the most beautiful thing ever has happened in their life, something that they embrace, something that they hold to, something that they yearn for is the cross. And the world is divided into those two camps. I would like to say it was equally divided, but the Bible tells us far more will reject the cross than ever receive the cross in their lives. There's a beautiful Old Testament story that kind of typifies this. It's found in the book of Numbers. The people were murmuring, not the first time we've read about that word in in the Old Testament. They were murmuring against God, murmuring against Moses. And so God basically said, I've had enough. And God sent these fiery serpents out into the camp. And as it would bite the people, they were dying. And the people ran to Moses and said, Moses, you've got to intervene for us and pray to God. Moses began to intervene for the people. And God said, hey, here's what you do, Moses. You erect on a pole an image of a fiery serpent. And anybody that would look upon that serpent that was bitten, they will be healed. And all through the camp, as the serpents were biting people and people were dying, those that had the faith in what God said, would look to that serpent on the pole and they would be healed. But you can imagine in the camp there were others who are saying, oh, that's foolishness. That I would look to something on a pole. That I would look for something like a serpent that's been lifted up 
and that it would make a difference in my life? It's the same with the world today. There are people that see the cross and they said, that's foolishness. That I don't believe in that. It has no bearing on my life. There's got to be more intellectually than somebody that would die for my sins. It's foolishness. And then there will be others that look to the cross. And it will be their theme and their praise for the rest of their life. For on that old rugged cross is where I found my salvation. See, the world sees the cross as something foolish. An innocent man dies for the guilty. Tell me how foolish that is. Letting people take your life when you have the power to take theirs. The cross is foolish. To forgive people who are worthy of judgment. To take up yourself the punishment which was meant for someone else. That you would take that upon yourself. How foolish that is. To leave paradise and to come to the sick world that we live in. To die for the very ones who hated you. You see, to the world, the cross is foolishness. And even in our modern day that you and I live in, the world sees the cross as something that is foolish. But Paul continues his thought, and, and he continues, and he says that the wisdom of the world will be destroyed. Look with me in verse 19 and 20. He writes, for it is written, I will destroy, notice the word, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever, and I will set it aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Men left to himself has not made this world a better place. In fact, the signs are that the world is becoming worse. Man, in all of his great wisdom and, and great knowledge that he boasts about, are we even better than we were? You see, that man, he cannot save himself. A man cannot find God on his own. He cannot produce eternal life within himself. A man cannot ever approach God on his own. We will see it through the preaching of the Word of God, coupled with the Holy Spirit that leads a man, leads a woman in that relationship with God. And so a man in his wisdom has not made this place better. Man in his wisdom and his pride and his arrogance cannot find God and have a relationship with Him. In fact, man wants to shun God. Man wants to lift himself up in the humanistic, secular world that we live in. Man wants to exalt himself and, and not the Lord. And Paul begins to find that he begins to ask the question in verse 19. Where is it, the scribe? We find that Paul loosely quotes this from Isaiah 29, verse 14. Paul dips into the Old Testament and pulls that out and, and uses that now. And he asks the question, where is the wise man? Would somebody step forward and, and point out a wise man in this age that we live in? Have we come any closer than peace? Have we solved the issues of world hunger? What about racial prejudice? We find our papers are filled with stories of murder and rape, nuclear 
um, threats of war, assaults. So where are the wise? When Isaiah first asked this question, where are the wise, he probably had in his mind the Egyptian wise man, the soothsayers, who led the Egyptians astray. And so Paul now takes it and he says, where are the wise people? Where are they? And then he doesn't stop there. He takes Isaiah's second question. He asks, where are the scribes? Where are the scribes? Isaiah probably had in mind the Assyrians, the most feared nation that has ever ruled in the history of mankind. They were cruel and violent and brutal as they would go to another country. People would literally shake as they would think about Assyrians attacking. They were so cruel as they would move in. But with them, they would have scribes with them to count the things they've captured. And the scribes would list, we've got 10,000 slaves, 100,000 chains of clothes, gold and silver, and the scribes would list it all down. And Assyria, nobody could conquer them. Until they fell off the face of the earth, my Babylon destroyed them. And Isaiah picks up in Isaiah 33, 18, and he asks this question, where is he who counts? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? What happened to them? They were so wise. They were so great. They were destroyed. And then Paul asked the question, where are the debaters of this age? In Paul's mind, he probably thought of the Greeks. Being in Athens and seeing those that would spend the day just debating the great questions of the day. Paul said, how did that resolve anything? What has ever been produced by that? Those of you that watch Fox or CNN, a couple of times a year, the great leaders of the world will assemble together at some summit, and they're all there getting their pictures made together. These are the strongest, the wisest, the most powerful men in the world that gather together. But when it's over, how has it changed our lives? Maybe higher taxes, right? But how has it changed our lives? They're so wise. They're so great. And so Paul asked the question, in all your wisdom that's being displayed, your wise men, your, your scribes, your debaters, have nothing on the wisdom of God. Take all that you know and all that you can produce and lay it beside the wisdom of God. And what do you find? You have nothing. Because God is going to destroy the wisdom of this age. And then Paul says, lastly, Christ, Christ crucified is foolishness to the world. You see, today our hope, our confidence, our security, everything that we know is wrapped up in the cross of Jesus Christ. The message of the early church was simple. Christ crucified and rose again the third day. Next Sunday, we'll have the joy of hearing our choir as they will be presenting the Easter musical to us. And we'll have the joy of, of celebrating because of the cross and that empty tomb. That is our hope. But to the world, 
Paul comes back and says, the cross of Jesus Christ, it's foolishness. Look in verse 21, we see that, that God's plan is that man can't find him. That man in his own wisdom, in his own intellect, that man left alone. He can't grope around. He can't study enough. He can't attain enough knowledge to find God on his own. And that was God's plan from the very beginning. That man needed to humble himself and say, I can't do it. I can't find God. I, I need help. And that help comes by the preaching of the Word of God coupled with the Holy Spirit working in a man's heart that leads him to Christ. But Paul says in verse 21, the man is utterly helpless in finding a relationship with God. God has ordained the preaching of the Word of God that draws men and women and children unto himself. It is the preaching of God's Word that, that he has ordained to bring people into that saving relationship. And God ordained that preaching. But Paul says it is the foolishness of the preaching of the cross. The foolishness of the message, he says in verse 21. Now was Paul making fun of the cross when he says that? Was Paul making fun of the message of the cross when Paul calls the message foolishness? I don't think so for a moment. For Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jews first and also the Greeks. Because of the cross, Paul was beaten. Because of the cross, Paul was in prison. Because of the cross, Paul went hungry. Because of the cross, Paul lost his very life. And so why would Paul call it the foolishness of the message? Paul's looking at it from the perspective of a lost world. And Paul says, you see it as foolish? Okay. It is that foolish message then that God has ordained to bring men and women into a saving relationship with Christ. And what we find is, what the world looks upon as foolish, God has ordained that to be the very thing that would bring men and women to himself. It is the foolishness of the message which brought you your own salvation. The world says it's foolish, but it's that foolishness of the message that brings you here today to rejoice in what Christ Jesus has done. Billy Graham tells a marvelous story about his first time that he, that he ever preached. It was in Florida. It was at a capacity crowd there of 32 people. And Billy Graham said at that time he had four sermons that were worked up. But he said when he began to preach that day, he was so nervous that he preached all four messages at one time. Are you ready for this? It lasted, he said, eight minutes. The foolishness. The foolishness of that. Preaching Christ crucified. But let me tell you how foolish it was. In a crowd of 32 people, there was a young boy that accepted Christ that day in an eight-minute sermon. Don't tell me that we need to go to eight-minute sermons, okay? But uh, that day, that boy came to saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see in verse 32, notice what he says. The Jews want signs and wonders. Oh, we will believe. If you show us signs and wonders, they've already had signs and wonders. They had the resurrected Christ. They saw his miracles while he's there. But they said, we, we want more. 
And notice what he says in verse 22, what do the Greeks want? Man, just keep giving us more knowledge. Keep giving us more knowledge. And Paul writes and he says to the Jews, Christ has become a stumbling block. While we were in Israel, there was a precious lady that was from Rock Point that was kind of traveling on the same plane, traveling in the same circles that we were. And they said that there was in Israel, like in any cities, they'll have these kind of concrete maybe barriers up. She tripped on one and fell right in the street face first. Her precious soul, when she was on the plane, she gets to look so miserable. She was so bruised up. Paul says, that's just like the Jews. Christ is something they stumble over. They, they fall over. He becomes a stumbling block to them, but they never come to that place where they recognize him as Lord. But notice to the Greeks, he just becomes foolishness. That's stupid. That's silly. That has no logic to it. That, that a man would die for the sins of the world who didn't deserve to die? Pfft, foolishness. That's foolishness. But I want you to see in verse 24 and 25, something happens. Even though the Greeks say it's foolish, and even though the Jews stumble over it, there will be some that will believe. There will be some that say that the cross is the most beautiful thing in the whole world to my life. Because it was at the foot of the cross that I cried out for the Lord to save me. And notice Paul's words, he says, that Christ is what? He is the wisdom of God and that he is the power of God. Man, it took something pretty great to save me. It took something pretty great to save you as well. They could reach into that old hard heart of yours and help you to realize that you were lost and that the wisdom of this world couldn't save you or your own doings. But it was only the cross of Jesus Christ that could reach into your heart and save you. And we see in verse 24 and verse 25, Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. But notice how he concludes in verse 25. Because of the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Paul was simply saying, look, from the world's eyes, if you want to say it's foolishness, okay, we'll use those words. Then I want you to know that the weakness of God is stronger than anything that man could ever produce. And the foolishness of God is wiser than anything that a man could ever produce on his own. There was a Polish Jew who lived through the concentration camp, and he was asked, you've seen death up close, you've seen people die, you've seen people tortured. Do you believe in a loving God? And he responded this way. He said, I looked at the man upon the cross and I knew I must make up my mind once and for all. Either I take my stand beside him and share in his undefeated faith in God or else fall finally into the bottomless pit of bitterness, hatred, and utterly despair." Just like that man, you have a choice to make. Which side of the cross are you going to be on? You have a choice to look at the cross and say, man, it's silliness, it's nonsense. It has no bearing on my life. Or you have a choice to look at the cross and to say it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to my life and to embrace the cross of Jesus Christ and his wisdom and his salvation that he gives. 
So today, what are you going to trust in? The wisdom of men or the foolishness of the cross? As for me, the cross is the power of God that would save one such as I. Father, I pray today that we will take our stand with the cross of Jesus Christ. Even though the world will shun it, laugh at it, ridicule it, put it down. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened in history. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. And there are hundreds, there are thousands that would take their place beside me and say, I have forsook the wisdom of this world for the foolishness of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we pray today, Father, that we will forsake the foolishness of this world and that we will take our stand believing in the preaching of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For in that we stand. And we pray this in Jesus' name. I wonder today if, if you are away from the Lord and you're in the world that you need to come back. Today's your chance, your opportunity to shun the foolishness of this world that we live in and to embrace again the wisdom and the way of the cross. And I wonder today if you're here and you've never made that decision. And you're trying to be neutral about it. The Bible says that we cannot be neutral. You're either for Christ or you're against him. And if you've never come to Christ, in a sense, you're against Christ. You say, well, how can that be? Well, you've got to be one way or the other. The Lord said there's no neutrality in faith. Have you made your decision? Have you said, man, I, I will embrace what the world calls foolishness. I will embrace that old rugged cross. For it's the only thing that can forgive me of my sins and give me eternal life. And today, if you've already received him, would you re-embrace that cross and make that cross your cry, your hope again in your life and leave here today assured that the greatest thing in life is knowing that you have met him and hearing the preaching of that old, old, rugged cross. Let's stand to our feet for a hymn of invitation if we would. Thank you.